Hello, friends. Welcome back to Colliding Worldviews. The question we are asking in this episode is, was Jesus merely a prophet or was he God? My guest who is here to help answer that question is John Stewart. He is a lawyer. He's an international speaker for Intelligent Faith. And he's also the scholar in residence at Rosio Christi. Website is intelligentfaith.com. And his books that you want to pick up are In Defense of the Gospels and More Than a Prophet. John Stewart, welcome back to Colliding Worldviews. Thank you, Tony. Great being with you. John, this is a claim that comes up all the time. You and I both have a heart for Muslims that they would come to know who Jesus Christ truly is. And some people, Muslims, of course, <laughs> claim that Jesus was just um, a man. He was a mere prophet. They deny that he was the Son of God. Um, is in more than just a title, like David's called the Son of God, and the people say, oh, that's just a title. They deny that he's uh, God in uh, the flesh. Why is the identity of Jesus so important? There's two aspects of Jesus that are crucial. The first is who he was, his identity, and secondly, what he did. You need both of them. You need to be right on both of them. So the identity, if he's God in the flesh, he is able to give us an eternal sacrifice that's good for the entire world, that he can die for the sins of everyone. And then what did he do? Did he die and rise from the dead? So the person and the work of Christ. So this, this time we're talking about the person of Christ, who in fact was he? And Jesus even asked that question himself of the disciples in Matthew chapter 16. And I think it's very, very important that we get this right. And Peter stood up as a spokesperson when Jesus asked the question, who do people say that I am? And then he turned the disciples and he asked them specifically, who do you say that I am? And that's the question that everybody ultimately has to answer. Who was Jesus? Christianity says, based on the gospel accounts written by the eyewitnesses, he was God in the flesh, the son of God who died for our sins. Some people, for example, in Islam say he was a mere prophet, a good man, born of a virgin, but nonetheless, not God, not the Son of God. So, the question is, can we trust the gospel accounts that say that Jesus was more than a prophet? But, Tony, we don't have to start with the gospels. We can go all the way back to the book of Genesis. The very first book of the Bible, in the very first verse, it says in Hebrew, Bereshit bara Elohim, in the beginning, and the Hebrew word for God, Elohim, is a singular root, L, with a plural ending. Why is that? And then you go to Genesis 1, 28. Let us make man in our image. And many places in the Old Testament give us some hints that God may be revealing himself in more than one person. And that, in essence, is what the Christian doctrine of the Trinity, which comes from the Bible, affirms, that God, the one God, has revealed himself in three co-equal co-eternal persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And of course, uh, many people don't understand the difference there when you talk about God and Christianity versus Allah in Islam. Uh, we both believe in one God. So this claim that Christians are uh, tritheists or we believe in more than one God, no. Uh, here, O oh Israel, here, Lord, Lord God, the Lord is one. <laughs> we have in the, the Shema, there, there's only one God, and God is a nature. Uh, I think this is a big issue that people um, don't understand, is that when uh, John and I, we know we're different people, but we have the same whatness, we have the same human nature. God is a nature. If we ask, who is God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, well, what is the Father, Son, Holy Spirit? God. So God is one what and three who's. Jesus is one who and two what's, because he's he's divine, but he's also uh, human. So uh, there are different ways we can explain it here. But the most important thing for people to know, especially because we have, of course, Muslim viewers here, we have many um, uh, other viewers as well who may follow whatever religion they happen to follow, but they aren't Christians. So we do want to educate them about Islam. We also want to reach out to Muslims and share the gospel with them and share the gospel with all people. But letting them know, uh, we both believe in one God, just that Christians are um, are monotheists, but we're Trinitarian. Uh, Muslims are monotheists, but they're um, Unitarian. So it's either one person who is God or three persons who are God. Now, I've, John, I've heard people say, oh, why can't it be four? I mean, you, you Christians, you say there's three. Why can't it be four or five? Well, technically, it, it, it could be technically. It's just that in the Bible, we only find three persons who are revealed 
to be God or who are revealed to be divine. Now, how do we compare that with Islam? I mean, do, does Islam teach that Jesus was more than a prophet? Was he divine? Oh, what? Please educate our viewers on that. Tony, I, I agree that we need to worship God on God's terms. So the question is, what has God revealed? And, and let me back up and, and ask the question, what, is, what does the Quran say about God? And according to Islam, God has 99 titles that are unique to him. For example, he's a creator. He's a giver of life. He forgives sin. He's the first and the last. Now, if you compare that to what the scripture says about God in the Old Testament, we find the very same thing. He's the creator. He's the giver of life. He forgives sins. He's the first and the last. So you see that Elohim, the, the Hebrew term for God or Yahweh, is very similar in the attributes as to that of Allah, that creator, sustainer, of giver of life, forgiveness of sin. I could go on and on, but I'm just giving a few there. And, and the first and the last. Now, if these titles are unique for Allah, for God, and the Old Testament confirms these attributes are true of the God of the Old Testament, Elohim, here's the question. If Jesus is merely a prophet, why is Jesus called the creator, the giver of life, who forgives sin and is the first and the last? So the very titles that are ascribed in both the Old Testament and the Quran regarding God, Allah, Elohim, are also ascribed to Jesus. So if Jesus is only a prophet, why in the world would he be given or called these very same titles as God? And then you have to ask the question, who should be worshipped? And Jesus makes it clear that only God should be worshipped. Luke chapter 4, verse 8, Jesus quotes from the Old Testament, only worship God. Yet Jesus himself was worshipped on at least three occasions. The disciples fell down after they calmed the storm and worshipped him. Why would Jesus be worshipped? Now, there was an account, there's a couple of accounts in the Bible where mere men, for example, Peter, was mistakenly worshipped. And what happened? Peter said, no, 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 you don't worship me, I'm a man. Jesus never told the disciples or anybody else who worshipped him, stop it, I'm not worthy of worship. He received worship, yet he's the one who said only God should be worshipped. The only logical inference, unless this makes no sense at all, is that Jesus is God, who is worthy of worship. And Tony, I was watching a, a, a video the other day from a skeptic by the name of Bart Ehrman, and many people who studied scriptures realize Bart Ehrman, former evangelical, but he turned skeptical. Bart Ehrman, as he reads the Gospel of John, says, clearly in the Gospel of John, Jesus is called God and sees himself as God. Bart Ehrman is an atheist or an agnostic leaning toward atheism. Jesus himself out as God. And we need to keep that in mind as we ask the different questions, and we hear people ask different questions about Jesus. John, I have a number of questions for you here as a follow-up to this first one, but we definitely want to give people the evidence that we find in the Bible itself for the deity of Jesus Christ. And, as the, and just to piggyback on the answer that you just gave, again, I think this goes back uh, many times to the confusion of what God is referring to. Many times Muslims, they'll, they'll say Allah which is just the generic word for the God, is not a personal name. And even, you know, many non-Muslims will say God, and they'll think of it like, like God is a personal name, like that is his name, God. I call God God because that's his name, where what we find in the Bible is that God is a, a, a nature. God is a nature, and God, the term God, is completely different than Yahweh, which is a personal name. When we look to the Quran, Yes, there are many different uh, names for Allah, but these are uh, in reference to his nature or supposedly things that he does. None of them are a personal name, and even Allah is not a personal name. It's just the God. So even Arab Christians call God Allah, 
but of course they do worship the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So anyway, uh, just in, informing people about the language and the terms that we use. John, how do you make the case that Jesus is God to a Muslim or someone who rejects Jesus' deity? Well, first of all, we, let's look at what the Gospels teach about Jesus. And again, if people have seen the other episode where we were together, we find Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are eyewitness accounts, reliable testimony of what Jesus said and did. So basing that as our foundation, what do we find in the Gospels? First of all, what did Jesus' followers say about him? Secondly, what did Jesus' enemies say about him? Third, what did Jesus say about himself? And last, what did early Christians after the turn of the first century say about Jesus? So let's start with what did his friends say? What did his followers say? And you have the account in John chapter 20 where Thomas, who was not present when Jesus appeared to the disciples the first time in the upper room, he had said, look, I want to touch the nail prints and then I'll believe. Well, then when Jesus appears to the disciples, when Thomas was present, Thomas makes the great confession that's found in John chapter 20, verse 28, where Thomas says, my Lord and my God. So Thomas affirms the deity of Jesus right there as clearly as can be that Jesus is indeed God. And as I mentioned, that even a skeptic like Bart Ehrman will say that in the Gospel of John, Jesus believes he's God and he is called God. Now, there's many other places where the followers of Jesus attest to his deity. So we have that. But what about his enemies? Because the followers could have got it wrong. What do his, what do his enemies say? So, for example, in John chapter 10, Jesus is about to be stoned. Jesus had just gotten through saying, I and the Father are one. And Jesus asked the question, for which of my good works are you trying to stone me? And they'd say, not for any of your good works, but that for you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. You see, his enemies understood his claim to deity. They understood that. And then even go to, for example, the Roman centurion at the foot of the cross. When Jesus dies on the cross, the centurion says, truly, this was the Son of God. So both the followers of Jesus and the enemies of Jesus confirm his identity, that he is God in the flesh. He is the second person of the Trinity, one God who's revealed himself in three separate persons. Okay, so we've got the friends, followers, and the enemies. But what did Jesus himself say? Jesus said, I and the Father are one. He who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus said in John chapter uh, 8, verse 58, he said, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus linked himself to the God of the Old Testament who revealed himself to Moses in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, where God, Moses asked God, look, what's your name? What's your calling card? When I go back to the people, I want to tell them who sent me. Who, who are you? What's your name? And so it says in Hebrew, essentially the English translation, I am the I am. And the Greek translation of that called the Septuagint in Exodus 3.14, ego eimi ha'on, ego eimi. Jesus says those very words, and John uses those very terms to ascribe what Jesus said before Abraham was, I am, referring back to the God who spoke to Moses out of the burning bush. Now, how do we know that Jesus really meant to be understood as God in that passage? What was the reaction? They picked up stones to stone him. So you see the enemies recognized that Jesus claimed to be God. So his followers, his enemies, and Jesus himself claimed that he was God. And then also, you go to the second century. What did the early Christians have to say about Jesus? And the early Christians said he was God, very God of very God. He was the second person of the Trinity. So we have historically the evidence that the second century Christians understood Jesus as being God, even after the time of Jesus. It's a tremendous case that's made by those facts and something that a Muslim is going to have to deal with if they're going to maintain Jesus is merely a prophet. 
And John, how can you make the case for Jesus's divinity uh, or his deity when you are talking with the Muslim? Well, I would actually present the fact that the Gospels are reliable accounts of what Jesus said and did. And I would say to the Muslim, if you believe Jesus is a prophet, which Muslims do, then he should be believed and go read the words he said when he said, I and the Father are one. No one comes to the Father except through me. And that indeed, Jesus gives reference to the Holy Spirit being that agent, that sec third person in the Trinity who will bring about these things that he's predicted. So we make the case by pointing to the very words of Jesus, the historical foundation, and then the burden would shift to the Muslim to explain, was Jesus misunderstood? That's why I bring up even an agnostic leaning toward atheism, like a Bart Ehrman, objectively, based on scholarship, will say Jesus claims to be God in the Gospel of John, and he believes himself to be God, and his followers call him God. So the record is clear. So the burden shifts to the Muslim to explain why did the eyewitness accounts get it so wrong if he's merely a man? And over and over again, he's called the son of God. And Islam says God has no son. So, folks, you have to decide, is Islam right? And Islam teaches Jesus didn't die on a cross. Even a skeptic like John Dominic Croissant, who was one of the co-founders of the Jesus Seminar, said that one of the best established facts of history is that Jesus was crucified. So if you have a belief that Jesus was not crucified and he's not God, that flies in the face of the evidence. And so I'm not talking about a spiritual belief here. I'm talking about the facts that come through these eyewitness accounts as to what did Jesus claim, what did his followers claim, what did his enemies claim to make the case as to the identity of Jesus. So that's the mountain of evidence that is there for people to see that God has revealed himself by becoming flesh. And that's why John chapter 1 Verse 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, cross tantas, face to face, and the Word was God. And John 1.14 says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. God becomes human that he might live a sinless life, go to a cross, die for our sins, that removes the barrier between us and God, so that when we trust in the finished work of Jesus, we can have our sins forgiven, and we will be saved. That's the good news, Tony. That's the gospel. Mm -hmm. Amen. And going back to what you said just a few minutes ago, John, uh, m many Muslims love to quote Bart Ehrman, and even he attests to the death of Jesus Christ. And he attests to, yes, his disciples obviously did believe that he rose from the dead. He died. And they believe, they truly believe that he did rise from the dead. Now, Bart Ehrman, of course, doesn't um, believe that Jesus Christ uh, is the person who we need to repent. And, and we need to repent, we need to put our trust in him to be saved and all of that, because he says he's agnostic now. Uh, but yes, when, even when it comes to Muslims, I, I've asked Muslims, hey, do you, can a prophet lie? They will say no. Well, look at the words of Jesus and what he said. Because if Jesus is right, Muhammad is wrong. And if Jesus is wrong, Muhammad's still wrong because he said Jesus is right. So there's a problem here either way, whether uh, Jesus is a prophet or not, and what if, whether he is right or wrong. Muhammad said that Jesus is trustworthy, that Jesus should be looked to, that Jesus is a prophet, etc. Now, when it comes to um, ta talking about uh, Jesus's deity, and the, and we and when we read the New Testament, yes, we read uh, how there's this there's this interaction. Uh, the hypostatic union, uh, the mystery of one being walking this earth, uh, one person. Of course, it was this, this was the eternal Son of God in human flesh. So he was fully God. He was fully man. And we see that he got tired. He got hungry. And we believe that he died on a cross, as the Bible says. Of course, that's referring to his human nature. At the same time, he performed miracles. He gave sight to the blind. He made the uh, lame walk. Uh, he knew the hearts and minds of men. He never asked questions because he wanted to know the answer. He asked questions because he wanted them to know the answer. He wanted them to learn something about themselves. That's why he asked questions, to teach them things. So we see this interaction, uh, and we see both natures in the New Testament, uh, amazingly. Uh, obviously, that is the mystery there. 
But Muslims and skeptics will say, well, we, some of these things that you're talking about, even though you're saying some is, is aspects of the human nature, some is of the divinity, there's a problem here. Because what about when he didn't know uh, when he was coming back? Uh, uh, if he was God, how could he die on a cross? And they are making that distinction again between a human nature and divinity. But John, please answer those questions there. Muslims will ask some good questions. They'll say, okay, okay, Mr. Christian, you believe Jesus was God. If he's God, how can God die? If he dies on a cross, how can God not know when he's coming back? How can God not know, you know, various things? And these are really good questions. But I, I think you've already touched on it because Jesus was both God, who is infinite, eternal, and he's also human. He's also man. And there is some aspect of mystery there where we can't fully explain how both the humanity and the deity of Christ can coexist in the one person with both the divine and a human nature. But Jesus as God, God can't die. But Jesus through his humanity can experience death because he could feel pain. He had all the same types of uh, human uh, uh, experiences that we have other than committing sin. So, hey, he could cut himself and bleed. And I remember when I was debating this Muslim sheikh, he was making fun of that, having, you know, God asked to, you know, go to the bathroom. Wait a minute. Jesus is both God and man. So recognize that within his humanity, he had limitations. And unless God the Father is allowing him to use his divine knowledge Jesus is limited to that which he knew by being taught. And the Gospel of Luke says Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and men. So Jesus had, on the human level, a natural upbringing where he learned the scriptures and the Lord revealed things to him at the appropriate time. And he lived his life in reliance on the will of the Father and the leading of the Holy Spirit. These are great lessons to learn. But the Jews themselves that Jesus was talking to, and Jesus' disciples were all Jews, they were strict monotheists, meaning they believed, like Muslims, there's only one God. So that's why, for example, when Jesus, and it's in Matthew chapter 9, and it's repeated in Luke chapter 5 and Mark chapter 2, the story of the man who was paralyzed, who was healed. And so these four friends have a paralyzed friend that they bring to Jesus at a little house in Capernaum. They couldn't get in because the house was crowded. So they dropped him down through the roof, pulled apart the palm fronds, dropped him at Jesus' feet. What does Jesus say? He says, son, your sins are forgiven. And according to the accounts, those who were standing there were thinking to themselves, well, who can forgive sin but God? That's a great question. Who can forgive sin but God? Only God can forgive sin. So Jesus says, okay, what would be easier for me to say? Either your sins are forgiven, well, anybody can say that, make a claim, or to say to a paralyzed man, rise up and walk. So Jesus said, so that you may know the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sin, which is a divine activity, rise up and walk. And the man rose up and walked as evidence that he had power in the spiritual realm to forgive sin. In the same way he said, I will demonstrate I am God and the Messiah by dying and rising from the dead. Jesus used evidence to support his identity, his deity, and his work. So the very person and work of Jesus is supported not merely by faith, but by the facts of what he did and what he said. Christianity stands on the facts not merely on what we want to believe or what we think ought to be, but based on what God has revealed and the facts that can be investigated. That is different than saying we have to believe in Islam because Muhammad says so. Well, we have the historical facts to back up what we believe as Christians. And not only do we have, uh, you know, if a, if a Muslim wants to point to the Quran, uh, we can look to the Quran to see that the Bible is trustworthy. Even if we don't look at the Quran, we need to look at the archaeological 
and manuscript evidence that we have. We have Bibles, complete Bibles, before the Quran was even supposedly written down. We have manuscripts after the Quran. <laughs> we have, we're continually finding more manuscripts every single year. So when Muslims claim that the Bible's been changed, which is actually a very new claim, I mean, we're talking, you know, 10 hundreds, 11 hundreds here, um, according to the Quran, according to what Muhammad said, supposedly, the, the scriptures which came before it are accurate. And again, we have complete Bibles before and manuscripts after as well. So if someone says, oh, the Bible's been changed, uh, well, when was it changed? Who changed it? What did it say before it was changed? I mean, none of these answers can be, uh, none of these questions can be answered, right, John? Tony, you're right on that, and I, I wouldn't confirm that merely to try to tell the Muslims or to embarrass them, but to say, look, you need to investigate. And most Muslims, I know they have a heart to know God, but your tradition mm -hmm. may be apart from the facts, so you need to reinvestigate and find out that what Islam is teaching you does not comport with the history and the reality of who Jesus was, who he said he was, and what he did. Amen. And that's what we need to, that's where we need to look, folks. Uh, we have Muslim viewers, we have non-Muslim viewers, Christian viewers who love to watch and, and get more apologetics to, to share with other people as well. But of course, remember that the gospel is the power of God into salvation. The gospel is who Jesus Christ is, what he did on our behalf, and how we can be reconciled to the Father through him. It was only the Son slash Word who took on the second nature, this human nature that we talked about today. The Father didn't take on the human nature. The Holy Spirit didn't take on the human nature. And yet Jesus, the name given to the God-man, to the eternal Son of God incarnate, spoke of the Father, prayed to the Father, spoke of the Holy Spirit, who is the true comforter who was to come, not Muhammad. He wasn't prophesying about Muhammad coming. He's prophesying about the helper coming, who would not only bring to remembrance all that he said and did, but would actually indwell us and live with us. Muhammad doesn't do that. The Holy Spirit indwells us. And John, it's such a, a blessing to have you here today to give this information, to answer these questions, because they come up all the time. And again, I want to point people to your book, also your website, intelligentfaith.com. But friends, get his books, In Defense of the Gospels and More Than a Prophet. Get both of those books, read them, you're going to get more apologetic knowledge. He has a bunch of scripture references in there, so you can look it up and say, hey, I'm just not believing because John said it, but the Bible says it right here as well. So, John, thank you so much for being here today and answering these, these questions. God bless you, and may the Lord continue to bless your work for his glory. My pleasure. Blessings to you. Friends. Thank you so much for being with us today. Remember, get the gospel out there. People need to know and understand it, and people includes all Muslims. Share the gospel with them. They're just the gospel away from leaving Islam. Not all Muslims, but many of them. And again, we plant the seeds. God makes them grow. God bless you. We'll see you next time on Colliding Worldviews.